Welcome to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. You know, in 1938, Franklin Roosevelt said, the first truth is that the liberty of a democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism, ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. So, people, welcome to the new world order. Same as the very old fascist world order, Stacy. Max, well, as all the chaos of the daily headlines happen, and they all seem so important, you know, the Greek crisis, the Ukrainian crisis, the financial crisis, what's happening in the background is a much larger story, and those headlines can possibly distract you from what's actually going on. And here's a headline uh, that is very important to concentrate on. A Blackwater World Order. The privatization of America's wars swells the ranks of armies for hire across the globe. After more than a decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, America's most profound legacy could be that it set the world order back to the Middle Ages. So this is regarding a new book by Sean McFate. He's a former army paratrooper who then joined DynCorp. And so he was part of these private military companies, these PMCs that are operating around the world. And what he suggests is that the Pentagon's dependence on contractors to help wage its wars has unleashed a new era of warfare in which a multitude of freshly founded private military companies are meeting the demand of an exploding global market for conflict. Right, exploding global market for conflict. This is the American economy. Uh, as many have said on this show, the U.S. dollar is backed up by America's perpetuation of global conflict. But getting back to FDR's quote, it's very important to understand that there's a tension, a dynamism between the public domain and the private domain. P private corporations do, uh, they, they fulfill a necessary function uh, in, in that there's a certain entrepreneurialism there that, that is at the heart of um, a, a market-based economy. But they cannot uh, expand to the point where they gobble up and destroy the, the public domain. Uh, the public domain is being destroyed either. It could be the ecosystem, which is the public domain. It could be the uh, intellectual property ecosystem of copyright law that's being used to destroy the public domain of public thought. Uh, and you go right down the list. So, and we're in a state and using these Blackwater contractor types as the point of the, of the, of the tip of the spear to encroach upon and destroy the public domain. Well, he says, basically, there is no public domain. The public has to be aware of the, of the fact that governments are not the powers of the world. In fact, he looks at it and he says that it coincides with what he and others have called a current shift from global dominance by nation-state power to a polycentric environment in which state authority competes with transnational corporations, global governing bodies, non-governmental organizations, regional and ethnic interests, and terror organizations in the chess game of international relations. New access to professional private armies, McFate further argues, has cut into the traditional state's monopoly on force and hastened the dawn of this new era. He calls it neo-medievalism and compares right now in the world to the pre-Westphalia uh, peace of 1648. So before 1648, before the nation state, Europe was a war zone for hundreds of years as the Vatican and bishops and, and oligarchs and princes and lords fought over power and uh, resources and, and, and wealth. And he said, this is what we're, we're, warns that this is what we're starting to see. And it was unleashed by the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq when the U.S. Army found itself. It didn't have enough actual army. So they ha went out and hired the likes of Blackwater and other private mercenaries who now are working, like Eric Prince, who ran Blackwater, which is has adapted several different other names. They operate in Somalia, Abu Dhabi. Eric Prince himself has, has basically fled to Abu Dhabi in order to avoid US, the U.S. justice system. So we're, we're having the same sort of thing. He said these people have a lot of power, and, they're in, and there's a point like during the pre-Peace of Westphalia that it's uncertain who's actually starting the war and whether they're doing it to, for private gain. Because if Eric Prince can make a lot of money by you know, resolving a conflict with military, his military force, 
it, it, it's in, he's incentivized to cause more conflict. Well, whether you call it neo-medievalism uh, or neo-feudalism, we've talked about this trend before. It's pre-enlightenment. The enlightenment gave us this idea of decentralized power. It gave us, it's not for nothing that Adam Swift, Smith's Wealth of Nations was published in the same year as uh, America become independent, 1776. And this was, of course, part of the Enlightenment, which was, it marked the end of the concentration of power in Europe amongst lords, uh, the church, the Catholic Church, and other centers of power, and who were wielding that power through creating a uh, perpetual war, 100-year wars. Mm. To, to, to people had to uh, flee into the, uh, inside the walls of the castle and then become serfs for the most part. And that was the system for hundreds of years during the Middle Ages, medieval, medieval period. And then we had the Enlightenment, and then we had the birth of what we would call decentralized power, which has its greatest expression today in two ways. Number one, Bitcoin, is the decentralization of power. It's the continuation of the Enlightenment. It's Dennis Diderot and Adam Smith in the 21st century. And also what we're seeing in Greece. There was a pro-government rally in, in Athens. That's pro-public domain. The leaders of the Tsaritsa party are about expanding the public domain against Germany's need to create a Fourth Reich, against Germany's need to create, uh, like Charlemagne, to try to conquer Europe. Uh, so Greece is pushing back against that. That's where we see this tension. Well, again, here's a guy, insider, ran his own private military corporation, his own private military company. And what he's saying is that states will not disappear but they will matter less than they did a century ago. So it's almost too late, he's saying. It's like you can elect Syriza, you can elect Podemos, you can elect the equivalent here, but your nation state doesn't have that much power anymore because they could be overthrown by, well, in the past week, uh, the BBC did a, uh, they actually went and looked at the Ukraine and what happened there. And they couldn't determine who these shadowy weird figures were, these snipers that killed the police. They, they couldn't determine whether it's the CIA or Russia. And, but in fact, they never even thought of the, the private military corporations or co the private military companies and what they're doing and who, whose side are they on. And it, they make a lot of money during any conflict. Is it just an outside force that just decided that they could possibly start a, a conflict for profit? And so he likens it, he links it back to Afghanistan, and he says the U.S. used contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan more than it had in any war in its history. In 2010, there were more contractors deployed to a war zone, 207,000, than U.S. service members, which is 175,000. In World War II, contractors made up only 10 percent of the military workforce. And so from 1999 to 2008 as well, he said the budget for private military companies went from $165 billion per year in the United States to private military companies in 1999 to $466 billion a year in 2008. So half a trillion dollars just from the U.S. is what is available for private mercenaries. So if you want the, the private mercenaries' money, that budget, you know, it behooves you to start some sort of conflict in a remote part of the world that the U.S. will just throw half a trillion dollars at you to go fight it. All right, and the U.S. leads this arson for hire campaign around the world, giving all this money to professional war starters, uh, like the Blackwater Group in their current iteration, that's <laughs> yeah. for sure. But, you know, the thing is you end up with a monoculture, and monoculture always fails versus a bio biodiversity. So we see this in, you know, the, the area of uh, genetically modified crops, fail, ultimately, because it's a monoculture. There's not enough diversity in the biosystem of those crops for it to survive over a long time. Uh, if you have an economy based on the monoculture of war, like the Americas becoming, basically, there's very little diversity in the American economy other than war. Uh, what happens is, like every other empire based on war, you hit the, the break point where the cost of maintaining that monoculture, which is highly inefficient, collapses. So let's also look at another thing happening, and we've been covering this for years, but this global trade deals. Who is pushing these? Who is operating this? And here's a guy who says private military companies are working for companies, essentially major corporations, in the shadowy world where the media doesn't go. And it's, I've seen the secrets of TTIP, and it is built for corporations, not citizens. This is from Molly Scott Cato. And she says, as an MEP, I'm party to the transatlantic trade's inner 
workings. I'm sworn to secrecy, but this much I can say, TTIP is undemocratic. So she got to go into this room where she was observed and had to give all of her, uh, her phone, her mobile, everything over, and she was watched by military, private military companies perhaps, to make sure she didn't write down anything that was in this TTIP deal, this global trade deal. And she says, as an MEP, I've now been granted privileged access to the European Parliament restricted reading room to explore documents re relating to the transatlantic trade and investment partnership deal. But before I have the right to see such top secret documents, which are restricted for the gaze of most EU citizens, I was required to sign a document of some 14 pages, reminding me that EU institutions are a valuable target and the dangers of espionage. Crucially, I had to agree not to share any of the contents with those I represent. No, TTIP is the Zyklon B of trade deals. The objective of this deal is to uh, wipe out and exterminate millions of people who don't have the money to buy a private contractor. That, that's, that, that's the point of TTIP. Anyone who thinks differently it, it will find themselves having a very short life. She's not allowed to tell her voters. She's not allowed to tell any citizen, any EU citizen, what she has read in this document. And what she says is, what we do know is that 92% of those involved in the consultations have been corporate lobbyists. Of the 560 lobby encounters that the commission had, 520 were with business lobbyists and only 26 or 4.6% with were public interest groups. So here we have this guy who is an insider of a private military company and then this MEP telling you that these global trade deals are happening written by corporations they're creating their own separate system of justice where they get to go to a panel of their peers and they could possibly sue your sovereign your nation state so we have two confirmation that the nation state is going away you can vote for whoever you want you can agitate for whoever you want you could protest but the fact is while all the chaos of the headlines reign, behind the scenes, we're returning to neo-medieval times. Absolutely. That's why we all need to support Greece. And the blockchain, no matter what happens in Greece, the blockchain will survive. And the blockchain is what's going to put TTIP six feet under. Okay. Stacy, we got to go. Thanks, Max. All right. Stay tuned for the second half. A whole lot more. Wasn't it more or less inevitable that those religious extremists that existed in Syria and that were in abundance uh, in, the, in the neighborhood, that they would seize on this opportunity, that they would use pro-democracy demonstrations for their own purposes? We knew that any time that this kind of uh, uh, uprising would happen, that the Islamists would of course jump on it. We know that the Islamists, with the backing of, of uh, countries, regional countries, as I said, Turkey, Qatar, Saudi, would jump on such a situation because they would be terrified of seeing uh, democratic change in, in their neighborhood. Stock rules in effect, that means you can jump in anytime you want. There's been a 40% increase in hate crimes against the Hispanic population in the past five years. Three Eastern Pennsylvania teenagers will stand trial for the fatal beating of a Mexican immigrant. There were many movies that were made where the Mexicans were bandits. The images on film and television, media as a whole, matter. And they matter because they shape the perceptions of a population within the borders of the entire community of that country. All of a sudden, we were to blame for crime. We were uh, to blame for the economy. We were to blame for everything that was wrong with education. We were to blame for everything. with 
Russia. Joining me in the now is Professor Lombard. Policies. Consider I'm Peter Lavelle. Pleasure to have you with us here on RT today. I'm Rory Sushi. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn back to Mitch Feierstein of PlanetPonzi.com. Mitch, welcome back and back and back to the Kaiser Report. Thanks, Max. All right. We left it off on an interesting note about Mark Carney, the Bank of England chairman. When he was in Canada, he inflated a huge housing bubble. It made him look like he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. They hired him over here by George Osborne to run the Bank of England. But now his legacy is that in Canada, the big housing bubble he blew up is now uh, crashing, right? Yeah, I mean, look at oil prices have collapsed, the currency is collapsing, and there's not really demand for property. The same thing is going to happen here. I mean, they've overbuilt property here. I believe, Max, that the property bubble in the UK collapsed. It already started popping and deflating last year, probably in Q3 of last year, and we're still seeing the beginnings of a collapse, which is going to bankrupt the banks, and I don't know how they're going to bail them out. You know, it's going to be a very difficult time. Well, either they let the bond market collapse or they're going to print money and create hyperinflation. Those are the two outcomes. Now, of course, Mitch Feierstein, we can't have you on without some charts. What do, what's this unemployment chart say? We've got two unemployment charts. The first one is the U3, which is a whale of a lie. Basically, the U3 is a government statistic that doesn't include the participation rate. And the participation rate is key. So in other words, if you get five years or whatever it is of unemployed unemployment benefits and you fall off the rolls, you're no longer unemployed. You just don't exist anymore. So you're not part of the statistic. So really, it, it's nothing but a tool for the propagandists and the government and Bernanke and Yellen to say we've reached full employment. Now, the key is, if we've really had full employment, then why would we need zero interest rate policy or negative interest rate policy? We wouldn't, and we wouldn't need these emergency measures. Now let's look at the second chart from 1977 to 2015. We have the labor participation rate. Look at this. It hasn't been this bad since Jimmy Carter was president. Basically, the unemployment numbers are job to give people an impression that things are better than they are and to talk it up. Most of the employment has come in part-time temporary low pay work and people, the savers that have been forced to work who were supposed to be in their golden years and retiring now have to work at Walmart for minimum wage. Right, so when people talk about employment or unemployment, they, they use a very broad statistical measure uh, that always favors uh, what you hear coming out of government offices. If you dig down a little bit and you look at some of these other, uh, the way the statistics are actually captured, instead of the U3, you look at the U6, or right. you look at these other different uh, charts, you get a much cleaner look and view. Into, it's like a, a microscope with a lot more power. You get a lot more view. So you're looking at things with a much more powerful view. Right. That's correct. And you're seeing yeah. the more of the truth, which is that the labor participation rate, the number of people that are actually in the labor force, it hasn't been this bad since Jimmy Carter. Let's, look, let's move on to another chart, the NASDAQ, uh, which is like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, except it's uh, ex mostly high-tech stocks and smaller cap stocks. The NASDAQ index is for Apple computer trades, et cetera. What do we see here? Well, if you look at what happened in the NASDAQ, that was the dot-com bubble that exploded with, with Alan Greenspan being at the helm of the Fed. And at that point in time, Mattel purchased the company for $3.5 billion that they sold a year later for $27 million. That's, you can see that the high on this chart was 5132 That's when Pets.com, the sock puppet, was on every TV channel. The company never made any money. They lost a fortune. It went down from 5000 and collapsed for years and years and years. We haven't even gotten back to the level, that 5000 level, yet to this point in time. Now, that was irrational exuberance. The bubbles that were created back in 2000 and 2001 now are bigger because back in 2000, 
the only market that was the biggest bubble on the planet was the NASDAQ. Now you have every global stock market and every global bond market and the property market that are all bubblicious. So when it explodes, it's going to get really, really ugly. Well, I mean, I would add that in the NASDAQ index is Apple Computer, mm -hmm. which is now over $700 billion in size, heading to a trillion dollars in size. If you took that one company out, which is almost a third the size of the British GDP, just that one U.S. company, you'd see, I think, a more representational picture of what's happening in, in the market. But you do have this behemoth, Apple Computer, that is on a tear. It's doing extraordinarily well. At what, what point competition comes on? comes well, in to eat at their margins, uh, we'll see. Well, Apple, Apple is um, the only stock that's been holding up, or one of the only stocks. You can see a huge divergence in all of the different but indices, S&P 500, they're, the they're Dow. They're using easy money from the Fed of to course. buy back their own stock. So right. that, it creates a distorted stock price, and, and it's not representational, of really, of what their franchise is worth. I want to move on. Let's talk about gold. That's the most important chart that you can ever see in your life. This chart that you're seeing right now, gold from 2000 to 2015. Now, I made a bet with some lawyer who represents his biggest client, begins with a G, the first word, second, begins with an S. Okay. A hundred pounds that gold performed, outperformed the NASDAQ. Gold from 2000 to 2015, as you can see in this chart, was up a whopping 370%. This is a chart you will never see on CNBC because it doesn't help the narrative. Gold, bad. Fiat currency, good. Now, you can also see here that um, Bernanke, while testifying in front of Ron Paul, said gold is not money. Now, we had Alan Greenspan, Dr. Alan Greenspan, that came out last year that said gold is a currency, probably one of the best currencies in the world better than any fiat, including the U.S. dollar. So now this is telling you something, and it should tell everybody who's watching this program, you need to own gold, and you need to own silver, and you need to own physical gold and physical silver. And you want to hold it somewhere that the government can't take it away, like in 1933. Yeah, well, look, I mean, as far as gold, you have to understand that we're talking about gold price in dollars, and even price in dollars, it's outperformed the NASDAQ. But if you look at gold price in things like yen, Euro or Canadian, Russian, or, Canadian Russian yeah. or Russian ruble, you know, in the last year or so, it's doubled yep. against the Russian ruble. So what we say in this show is gold is real money, and people in Russia who bought gold a year ago, even though the currency, the fiat money, ruble has been down, their purchasing power has remained absolutely constant. They haven't seen a loss of anything because gold functioned as it always has throughout history as real money. So these other currencies, particularly the euro recently because of all the chaos in Greece, et cetera, gold's been moving up against the euro. It's been almost at a new all-time high against the yen, which is phenomenal. And of course, the dollar will, they'll see that all new time high against the dollar at some point. But by then, I wouldn't be surprised if the availability for gold for purchase by the average retail schmo is exactly zero because there won't be any gold available at any price because there's not that much of it around. Your thoughts? Well, gold is very important. It's got a, a track record of 6,000 years of being a currency. So I don't care what anybody tells you, you need to have gold in your portfolio. I mean, it is a safe haven. And I wrote in Planet Ponzi, my Russian version, and in my Chinese version two years ago or three years ago, that one of these countries, either China, Russia, or the BRIC nations, are going to come up with a currency that's based in gold. I still hold that view that somebody's going to go back on a gold standard. And now if China were to do it, think about what's happened in China now. From 2000 to 2015, Max, they've spent $28 trillion that they've printed. Okay, to, from 2000 to 2008, they spent seven trillion. So this is marginal utility, marginal returns. And then from 2008 to 15, they ratcheted up another 21. So they got less returns. Now this money has to all be repaid. Now when China blows up, which I think we're in going to see very soon, right? They're going to take their 1.3 trillion in U.S. bonds, and then you'll have your bond apocalypse because yeah. they're going to start selling bonds, and then the, interest rates will skyrocket, which will cause a default. Right. right. Here's, here's a question that Stacy uh, wanted to ask. It's a very interesting kind of thought piece here. So if 1% of the population owns 50% of global wealth and uh, money velocity comes to a standstill, it doesn't it effectively, it's like in the game of Monopoly, it would be game over. I mean, it's just suddenly there's a point at which 
like Monopoly, when at the end, the one person has all the money, all the wealth, all the housing, and the game is over. So if, one, if, yeah. the, if this 1% class continues to aggregate all of the wealth, isn't it similar to the game of Monopoly? You just simply have to call the game. It's over. It's over. But that's, we have the chart on the velocity of money that we should have a quick look at, which says liquidity is not a solution for insolvency. And basically what's happening is you can keep printing and printing and printing. And this is what the Bank of England has done, the U U.S. Fed, the Bank of Japan, the ECB now wants to get in on it. They, the Keynesian philosophy is just print more money. Now, if this really worked, you would see a pickup in the, in the global economy you haven't seen the pickup that they claim that you'd get. So they're spending like $5 to get $1 in GDP, and it's a fake GDP. So the velocity of money collapses. It is a sure indicator that what they're doing doesn't work. So when it doesn't work, you should have a plan B. The plan B is no plan B. It's print more. Don't be sore. Print some more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's uh, drill down to a, a specific company here in the UK. Uh, let's talk about a company well-known here in the UK, Tesco. They had a horrible year of accounting fraud, so they're going to shut down shops, and they're going to expand into mortgages. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so this seems like a perfect setup for a Planet Ponzi answer. Your thoughts, Mitch Firestein. Well, you know, first of all, the mortgage market is <laughs> totally out of control everywhere. In the, but in the United States, the Fed owns all the mortgages. I mean, I think that, that Mark Carney, who went from Bank of Canada to Bank of England, and he's running the, the uh, risk board for, in Switzerland for all derivative product risk. So he's got many hats on. Who? Mark Carney. Yeah, know, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So the problem with this is I don't know if the UK government is going to come out and start buying all the mortgages because their GDP, as you know, is only $2.6 trillion which is about half the size of a company like BlackRock, which has $4.3 trillion in assets under management. Yeah, so uh, like the Fed, the Bank of England will ultimately have to come in and buy those mortgages. From Tesco. Uh, yeah. From Tesco, to, for dodgy uh, properties. So will they say, aisle seven, we're having a mortgage special, next year eggs and next year butter. Every little bit helps. I guess. Every, every little mortgage helps. There you go. T Tesco, you know, you got to... Show a little love. <laughs> you got to get a little love. All right, so the UK general elections of 2015 are heating up, and so is the propaganda. Uh, let's tell us about the Americans running the party campaigns. We touched upon this earlier, and I was quite shocked by it. We've got about a minute left. So uh, it seems like discredited or bankrupt or sleazy or dodgy corporations, whether it's the folks trying to take over the New Era estate over in East London, you know, they were thrown out of America and they came here. Now you've got some old spin doctors from a couple of elections ago who can't get any jobs in America anymore, so they hire them over here. Well, no, it's funny because it's Jim Messina and David Axelrod you're talking about, and the Tories and the Labor had hi hired both of them to come over one against the other. So both of them worked on Obama's campaign, and now they're heads, heads up against each other. They're generating fees. So instead of going into banking, people should come out and do that, because propaganda is the new art form. It's the new black, I think. Well, propaganda has replaced price discovery. Yeah, but, you know, if you okay, look at... I mean, that's a profound statement. Right. I just don't want it to, I, to go unrecognized by Mitch Feierstein as being one of the most profound statements I've ever made on this show it, it in has. the last 10 seconds that we have. I, I absolutely agree with you. But look at the, can you trust the media? You've got, you know. Only this show. I only right. trust this show. This is the best show. We deal in the truth. That's Unlike right. those other networks that peddle fraud. Absolutely. Brian Williams, is he coming on soon? Uh, yeah, of course. He's got a new show on, on RT called The Big Lie. <laughs> All right. So, Mitch Farside, thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Thanks for having me. That's it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Mitch Firestein of PlanetPonzi.com. If you'd like to get in touch, tweet us at Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.